830-2s. Welcome to this video. And what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to walk through the last fully released diploma we have from 30-2, which was in 2019. So again, I'll include the link to this in the description of the video. But I mean, again, all you do is just Google Math 30-2 Diploma 2019, and you'll see a PDF pop up right away. Now, what I need you to have with you, for sure, you need your formula sheet. A thing to point out here about the formula sheet, friends, if you have been using anything that's not on here, you don't need it. Only formulas that you need in 30-2 are right here. Okay, so if you did something extra in class, that's awesome, but you're not going to see it on the diploma. The other thing you need is your graphing calculator because we've got a lot of stuff to do, graphing and regressions. Okay, let's get right to it. So when you download the PDF, what you'll see is it'll walk through just some introductory stuff that you don't really care too much about. What you probably care about most is getting here. And what it tells you is that here's your answer key for each question. The diff, the difficulty, tells you how the province performed. So when this was written, what it says is for numeric response number one, 83.5% of the students got that question correct. Okay, here's your answers. Um, and then over here is the topic and the outcome and the cognitive level. I, I don't know if you care too much about that myself. That's more for teachers that care about that. But if you want to do a bit of a deep dive into those things, go right ahead. Okay, so remember your diploma, 24 multiple choice, eight numeric response, and then the 30-2 has two writtens with several parts each. I'll talk about the written in a separate video. For now, let's just focus on multiple choice and numeric response as long as my voice can hold up to talk about the whole diploma. Okay, what I would like you to do though is what would be best is if you downloaded the PDF and tried everything on your own first before just watching me do questions. Okay, so I will assume you've done that and I will start working through these things. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, your diploma is going to start off with three logic and puzzle questions, unless there's one on the written. And then there'd be two to start off with. Now, personally, friends, what I would do is leave these until the end and then come back to them. I find sometimes what happens when I'm vetting the diploma is I get stuck on these questions and I start to lose momentum at the beginning of the exam. I don't I have limited brain power to begin with, friends. I don't have time to be energy to be wasting on three questions. But here we go. So a puzzle question is meant to be something you've never seen before, complete instructions given to you, and you need to be able to solve it. They can be easy, they can be hard. Let's find it. So we've got this puzzle. We're going to use the digits one through nine, arranged in the triangle. Each digit can only be used once. When the puzzle is completed, the digits on each side of the triangle must add to 17. A partially completed puzzle is shown below. Okay, and then what do they want us to find? They want us to find B, D, E. Okay, so what I'm going to say is we're only using the digits 1 to 9. So I can see that we've already used some. So here's the digits that we still have to place in this question. Now, I don't know, I'm looking at this thing kind of saying, hmm, I can't really see right off the bat one that jumps out to me, A, B, C, D, or E. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to do a little bit of trial and error, to be honest with you. I'm going to take a shot that A, given that it's at the, it's got to have two sides of this triangle added up, and over here I see a nine, and over here, I'm already at a sum of eight. I'm going to try A is one. I got nothing to lose. All right, I'm going to try A is one, and then I'm going to see what happens. Okay, well, if A is one, then this side over here, well, that adds already to seven, nine. So that would make E eight. All right. Now, how am I doing so far? Well, I've got three digits left to go, three, four, and seven. 
Well, on this side over here, I can't use the seven because I'm already at one plus nine is 10. So I'm just gonna guess that maybe B is three or four. Let's just try four. If that's four, then that's five plus nine, that's uh, 13, 14, perfect. So then C has to be three. And then if I've done this correctly, D is gonna be seven. And then I add up that side and sure enough, that side's also 17. Okay, so the answer that they wanted us to give was B, D, E. Well, B was four, D was seven, and E was eight. Okay, so I trialed and errored that thing a little bit and I got lucky on my first shot. You know, I'm not gonna always get it correct the first time. It's a puzzle question, but that's what I mean when I say I kind of skip these things because they, they can take a while. Okay, let's try another one here. <clears throat> Pardon me. A student's playing a game where she's trying to determine a four color code that has been selected by her opponent. Colors may be repeated. And after each of her guesses, her opponent responds by providing information about how many colors are correct and whether each color is in the correct position or not. Here's her first four guesses. And then what it tells us at the bottom here is we've got to select what the actual code is. Okay, this is interesting. So what do we know? The first guess is she guesses all four reds. And it says two colors are correct and in the right position. All right, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a peek at the answers. So it says two colors are correct and in the right position. So what I know for sure is that these reds, given the answers, are correct in the right position. So what we're looking for then are the second and third spots. Okay, there's row one, kind of guess number one taken care of. Um, row number two, one color is correct. Well, that's probably the red. We know it's the red um, and in the right position. That's that one right there. One color is correct but in the wrong position. Well, I actually think that's that right there. So I don't think this helps us at all. What it does tell us though, is there's no blue. Because if there was a blue in here, it would tell us the color was correct and in the wrong position. So I guess we just figured that out. There's no blue. So now I know the answer is not A. All right, we're getting there. Guess number three. Three colors are correct and in the right position. Well, I know that's correct and that's correct but I can't really tell which one's correct out of the yellow and the white. I just know one of them's correct. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Last one, two colors are correct and in the right position. One color is correct, but in the wrong position. Okay, well, wait a minute. I'm gonna come back to here. I know then that that white is can't be the white because in the guess number three, it said there was three in the right position. So what I really just figured out is it's not white. So now what I know then friends is it's gotta be that green one. The green has to be correct, but in the wrong position and the yellow, so green's gonna go over here. And then that means the yellow is in the correct position. We're looking at answer D. Okay, I mean, that's an interesting kind of puzzle question. Again, logic, right? All right. Now, this one here, I'm hoping maybe some of you have seen. I believe this is called a Ken Ken puzzle. And I do them in my class with my students. So I've got a bit of the knowledge here to begin. So there's 16 squares in the grid. In each puzzle, there's also four shapes outlined by bold black lines. The puzzle is completed by entering the digits one to four so that the one to four appears in each row, in each column, and in each outlined shape. And they can only appear in each outlined shape once. Okay, so our job here then, friends, is to figure out the rest of these. You know, in some sense, it's almost like um, a Sudoku, right? We're gonna figure out what goes where. So where I'm gonna start is I see the I'm gonna look at this row here and I see there's a three here. And I'm gonna to say to myself, I'm gonna look at this box. 
this box needs a three and a four, but the three can't go anywhere in that row. So what that tells me is the three has to go there. Well, if I know the three goes there, I have no choice. That means the four has to go here. Okay, I'm getting there. Now, where am I gonna attack from here? I'm not quite sure yet. Um, what I know for sure is in this L looking shape, we've already got the three. But in this column here, I'm missing a two and a three. Well, since the three can't go where B is, that means that has to be the three. Well, what does that tell me B is? Well, in that column, I'm missing the two. Awesome, I got a column done. Coming and looking at this row here, I'm missing the one. All right, we're getting there, this is good. Now I see ones in three of the columns. The one's missing from this column. So that means one has to go there then tells me right directly beneath it that has to be a four to the side of it that's got to be a two in the l looking shape that's missing a four at the top of this column i'm missing a two this row is missing a four and that's a three and so there it is friends answer a b would be four two now, again, I've got some experience doing that question. I could see that being difficult if I'd never done it before. And again, just the reasons why I like to leave those things till the end myself, but it's up to you. You maybe you're better at puzzles than I am. Okay, now we're into the rest of the questions. So now what your diploma is gonna start with is some information off of set theory. Again, friends, I go to my formula sheet, and any symbol that I need for set theory is gonna be held in here, okay? So if you've been using any other symbols in class, you don't need them on the diploma, just these ones, okay? Remember that the word intersection is associated with the word and, the word union is associated with the word or, subset means one item, is completely contained in the other. The empty set means it's empty. And the complement means what I am not looking for. Okay, now that we've talked about that, let's go back. Which of the following set operations, so there's X, Y, Z, will produce the empty set? So we're looking for that. So really all I'm looking for here are two sets that are disjoint that have nothing to do with each other. Okay, well, here we go. Let's just try X and Y. Well, if I try X and Y, the first thing I notice, they both have Ontario in common. So it's not X and Y. So trying to trick me, it's not that. Friends, it can't be the union of two things. That means you're adding two sets together. They wouldn't be empty, they'd be getting bigger. By default, the answer is A. But what I'm gonna do is go back and check. Is there anything in common between those two things? No, sir. So there it is. There's your empty set. Okay, not a bad question to start, hey? Eh? Okay, a class of 25 students, so that's our universe right there, was surveyed to determine the music they like alternative or pop. The results of the survey are partially shown below. Okay, so it's not all filled in. So the first thing I wanna do, maybe even before I look at the question, is say to myself, well, there's 25 students in the universe. But when I add these numbers together, five, three, and 13, that's only 21. What that tells me is there's four people out here who think that alternative and pop are garbage. They don't care for it. Now that I've got a complete Venn diagram, let's attack the question. So they give us these four statements and we want the two statements that are true. Okay, let's just work from top to bottom. Statement number one, it says is A a subset of P prime? Another way to say that is A a subset of not P. Well, not P, 
is A in, not P. Well, let's go back and look at our diagram here and think to ourselves, what's not P? Well, not P is everything outside of P. That's not P. And then I say to myself, is A completely contained in the shaded region? The answer is no, because this part, the three people right there, are not included in that shaded region. So now I know that the first statement is not true. All right, one down. Trying to trick me, not that one. Next statement, P union A. Well, P union A, P or A, means we add these numbers together. That's 21. It's definitely statement two. Statement three says P intersect A. Well, P intersect A is where they have elements in common. That would be three. So again, by default, I immediately know the answer is statement four, but let's figure it out to be certain. What this says is not P union A, not, and it helps if I can put my parentheses in the right spot, right? <laughs> you can tell I'm sick. Not P union A. Well, not P union A is everything out here, which is four. So there it is. So our correct statements are two and four. There it is. Okay. So we took care of some unions, some intersections, some complements, some subsets. We did a lot in one question. All right. Question number four. A bowl contains five white, four gray, three pattern erasers as shown below. Isn't that diagram pretty? If an eraser is randomly selected from the bowl, and then the odds against, I'm gonna bold that word against, selecting a white. Okay, friends, here's how I always do odd questions. I always write this, in favor, against, total. Right, you'll never forget it, F-A-T, fat. Okay, total, how many erasers are there? Well, five plus four plus three, there's 12. Okay, in favor, well, I'm looking for a white eraser. There's five whites. Against, well, there's seven erasers that are not white. So the odds against selecting a white then, all I say to myself is odds against. So I want against to four, there's seven that aren't white, there's five that's white. Boom, there it is. Don't forget when we're talking about odds, we don't include the total amount right there. I can immediately tell those two are wrong and D is the odds in favor of. So my suggestion to you here, friends, on odds questions, if you see the word against, Make sure you bold it. And I love to do this because it makes it really easy to do odds questions and to convert to probability. Okay, set theory, looking okay so far. Okay, and our three, what do we got? The probability that Soren watches the evening news on any night is that out of 365 days, the number of days that he's not expected to watch the evening news. So that's the compliment, friends. So the compliment then, if he's not watching, is one minus 0 0.63, that's 0 0.37. So there's a 37% chance he doesn't watch the evening news. Okay, so how many days is that? Well, not watch would simply be equal to 365 days, times there's a 37% chance that he watch. He's not going to watch. Okay, I put that in my calculator and I'm going to get 135 decimal something small. So 135, just like that. Okay, let's keep trying. A child is allowed to have two treats from a bag containing 21 chocolates, 11 hard candies, 10 gummies, lucky kid, look at that. 
all three types of treats are in packages of similar size and shape. Okay, so the reason they said that is so that the kid puts his hand in and doesn't recognize that something's a Reese's Pieces and some, something's like a nibs or something, right? Since they can't decide what they would like, the child reaches into the bag and randomly selects two treats at a time. Okay, lots of reading there. The probability, I'm gonna underline that, that the child selects one chocolate and then one gummy. Ah, and they're selecting one at a time. So what I'm thinking right off the bat, friends, is this is dependent events. Now, if I wanna look for a formula, I go to my formula sheet and I say dependent events is actually right here. Now, the majority of the time, friends, I don't need to write down that formula, but if you needed to, what you would say in this case is the probability that this child receives a chocolate and a gummy is equal to the probability they get a chocolate first times the probability they get a gummy given they had a chocolate. Now, did I need to write that to answer this? Probably not. Let's find out. Probability they get a chocolate. Well, there's 21 chocolates and there's how many candies in total? Treats, I guess I should call them. There's 42 in total. So 21 out of 42 times the probability I get a gummy. Well, there's 10 gummies, but now friends, it's dependent. There's only 41 treats left in the bag. And at this point, all we've got to do is multiply those things in our calculator. And when you do, you're actually going to get a pretty small probability, 0 decimal one two two. All right, so there's dependent events, not so bad. All right, what do we got here? Sally is decorating one wall in her room with movie posters, and she's only going to hang five of the eight posters she owns in a single room. Okay, she's going to put her favorite poster in the middle and the number of different arrangements. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a picture. Now, if this was on the written portion, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show my operation so that the person marking knows what I'm doing. The person marking is not allowed to assume what you're doing. Put the multiplication in. Now, Sally wants her fave right here. Well, she's only got one favorite poster. Boom. That's her Batman poster, right? One Batman right there. And not new Batman. Awful. The old Batman, Michael Keaton. Now, what about her other posters? Well, there were eight posters, but she's hung up Batman in the middle. Now that means there's seven to go here. You obviously can't reuse a poster. Six, five, four. So, what that is is seven times six times five times four. I go ahead and I put that in my calculator. I'm going to get 840. Now, the other thing I wanna point out here is it says the word arrangement. What this means is order matters. This is a permutation. The reason why this is a permutation, friends, is because I can tell the difference if I walked in her room and if she had I don't know, Care Bears over here and Transformers over here, or if they were all switched up, okay? So this is like you standing in line, the question you're standing in line to take a picture. Order matters, it's a permutation. I use fundamental counting principle to answer the question, and I think that's the easiest way. Okay, there we go, 840. All right, what do we got here? From 1951 to 81, the first digit of every three-digit area code, okay, was a number from two to nine inclusive. So that's eight numbers, by the way. The second digit was either zero or one. Okay. The last digit followed the following rules. If the second digit was zero, the last digit can be from one to nine. If the second digit was one, the last digit can be from two to nine. Okay, weird. Okay, I don't know. What have I got here? Well, I've got these two area codes is what I see. I've got the first area code, 
where it says all area codes start with the number two to nine. So they both have to start with the eight. But then what it says is the second digit was zero or one. So that word or tells me I've got cases. I'm gonna add, that's or. So what I'm gonna say if the zero was here or the one was here. Well, if this is the zero, there's only one zero. And if this was the one, there's only one one. Okay, if the second digit was zero, it had to be from one to nine. That's nine numbers. If the second digit was one, it was from two to nine. That's eight numbers. So now all I'm gonna do, again, if this is on the written, please put in your operations, because then just in case, friends, you screw up, at least the person marking knows what you were doing, you'll probably benchmark at a decent mark instead of just getting zero, right? Show your work. Answers B. Okay, so there it is. Again, I did that one as fundamental counting principle, but with cases. So when I see that word or, I'm thinking cases. All right, and R4, we're cooking through this thing. Got to remember, there's only eight numeric responses. We're already on to our fourth one. What do we got? Golf shops got eight different drivers. Six different irons. Susan's going to purchase three different drivers and two different irons. Determine the number of different golf club selections. There's a big word she can make. All right. Really what we're trying to figure out here, friends, is does order matter? Does the order matter for, of the drivers, how Susan buys them? It doesn't. And it doesn't matter the order of the irons, how she buys them. This is a combination. The other thing I want you to notice is the word selection. Selection is the agreed upon word for combination. Arrangement means permutation. So what do we want? What I always do is I write a sentence. So we want three drivers and, and means multiply two irons. Well, it's a combination. There's seven drivers. We need three of them. There's two irons. I need six of them. Now, that's how I would write that. And that's how I put that in the calculator. Just in case, friends, I do need you to know, I'm going to go to your formula sheet here. And I'm going to scroll to where it shows us combinations. Where's combinations on this thing? right here. What I need you to remember, friends, is that there is another way to write that just in case it pops up on the diploma. So friends, this is the same as this. All right, those are the exact same thing. Okay, I don't like to write it that way either. I'm just going to go ahead and put these two in. 7C3 is 35. And so I'm going to multiply 6C2 is 15. And 35 times 15 is 525. Okay, so again, looking for perms, looking for comms, and looking for keywords, arrange and select. Okay, they can help you out of a jam. All right, what do we got here? Finley's got eight game pieces that differ only in color. Okay, so they're all identical except for color. Each game piece is either all red or all black. So two colors. When Finley lines up eight pieces in a row, there are 28 distinguishable arrangements. Okay. Based on this info, how many red pieces are there? How many black pieces are there? All right. Well, if Finley is lining these up in a row, that means I'm going to draw a picture. And really, there's eight pieces that could go there, and then seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and like that. So a better way to write that is eight factorial. But now what this says is because I can't tell the difference between these reds and these blacks, what I'm going to have to do All right, sorry about that. I had a little coffin fit here. <laughs> Didn't want you to have to listen to that. 
So what we know now is that these are identical objects. And so there's some amount of reds that I'm gonna divide out the identical objects. And there's some amount of blacks that I'm gonna divide out those objects. And what I know is that equals 28 arrangements. So what I say to myself now is, how am I gonna figure out the reds and the blacks? Well, unfortunately, what I'm gonna to have to do here, at least all that I see friends, unless you see a better way, is I'm just gonna do trial and error. So it says there's four reds and there's four blacks. So if I went and tried those and sub those in, I would have, I'm just gonna scroll down a little here for some space, I would have eight factorial over four factorial, four factorial, okay? So I go and I plunk that into my calculator and let's see if it's 28. Nope, not 28. Well, it's not A. Well, then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna check the next one. Five factorial, three factorial. So I grab my calculator and I plunk that in. Nope, not that one either. All right, trial and error. Let's go and try six and two. And there it is, it's six and two. Okay, so that tells me that there were six red game pieces and two black game pieces. So I don't know, I don't really care for that question. There's a little bit of trial and error as I see it, unless there's a better way, there could be a better way. I'm sick, so I'm not gonna be perfect today. All right, what do we got here? Let's go back to hot pink. I need to cheer myself up because I'm sick. Group camp employees. It's got five leaders, eight assistants. Particular activity requires five employees. Oh, the big word here, at least. Okay, bold that. At least four of whom are leaders. So again, I'm going to make a sentence. What does this mean? At least is my minimum. So that means I need four leaders or five leaders. But what goes wrong quite often here, so how many ways do I get four leaders? Well, order doesn't matter because I'm not assigning roles. Roles are already assigned. So there's five leaders, I need four of them. Or I'm gonna add, there's five leaders and I need five of them. Now, I can see a lot of people selecting C, but C is wrong. And the reason why C is wrong is because in the first option here, I don't have all five of my participants. I also need one assistant. So how many ways can I get an assistant? Eight, C, one. Just like that, answers A. So when I'm doing these questions, friends, to check my work, what I do is I add up my total like this. And I say five plus eight is 13. Yep, there's 13 people. Four plus one is five. Good, I need five people. Now, notice in the answer, it just says 5C5. I'm a big fan, and I know I'm a little different than most, of writing this. And the reason, again, why I write that is because eight select zero is one, but because, again, now I can see I've got all 13 people, and I got all five that I needed. Okay, it doesn't show up in the answer, but I'm a big fan of writing it. I'm also a huge nerd, so that's just something I do, but that's how I check my work, friends. Answer is A. What do we got here? How many distinct, meaning I can tell the difference between them, four letter arrangements, permutation, order matters, using the letters in the word script? So again, you need to know that you can't use the letters more than once, they're unique. I like to draw pretty pictures. And what am I gonna get here? Well, again, I'm gonna multiply because I need a letter and a letter and a letter and a letter. I could just multiply that and put that in my calculator, or I could say to myself, permutation, order matters, six objects, I need four of them. 6P4. And when I go and stick that into, if I wanted to, you know what, for giggles, let's use our formula. Six factorial over six minus four factorial. That's 720 over two factorial, which is two. 
Answer is B. And there it is. So two different ways to do the question. Whatever makes you happy. Don't care. Okay, just remember letters in a word. You can't reuse a letter. They're like people. Okay, now we're into rational expressions. So it says the simplified form of this guy and its restrictions are respectively. Okay, here we go. Step one on any rational expression is to factor. So I see a greatest common factor of 3x. And in the denominator, I see x minus 1, x plus 1. It's a difference of squares. Then what I notice is x minus 1 and x minus 1 divide out. And I know I'm probably doing it right because something divides out. I'm left with x plus 1 in the denominator. So I immediately know the answer is not A or B. Now, the question is, is it C or D? Here's the important thing. When I go to look for non-permissible values, I look before I simplify, before I divide. So I look here, x can't equal positive negative one, right? You can see the wrong answer would be if the student only looked here. Don't do that, that's bad, okay? So you're always gonna look before you simplify. There it is, there's number 11. What do we got here? An expression equivalent to this with non-permissible values of negative three and zero is written in this form. Uh, okay, where A, B, C, and D represent single digit whole numbers. All right, well, what are we gonna do on this one? Well, what I'm gonna say is, I'm gonna figure out what we multiplied by. And what I can figure out is going from negative eight to negative 16, we multiplied by negative, oh no, we multiplied by positive two, not negative two, and also x. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply numerator and denominator by two x over two x. Remember what you do to the numerator, you do to the denominator, because you're really multiplying by one in a sneaky way. You're maintaining equality. So now I multiply, 2x times x is 2x squared plus 6x. Okay, so it says, what's a? 6, what's b? 2, what's c? 2, and what's d? 6. Now, I've got the time on my diploma, I've got six hours. Don't spend six hours writing your diploma, friends, but if you wanted to, work backwards now. So factor the numerator and denominator and make sure you ended up with what you were supposed to. If you can do that, friends, I'm pretty sure that that means I've done the question right. Okay. What do we got? Number 12. The number of distinct, okay, distinct means I can tell the difference between them, non-permissible values. Okay, this is a division. So when I'm dividing friends, I need to remember I'm looking in three places. There, there, and there because really that entire second term is in the denominator. Okay, what's distinct? Well, there's one, there's positive nine. I've already got positive nine, so I'm not going to include that one. Positive eight, sorry, negative eight, liar, and zero. Well, how many are distinct? Four, there it is. Okay, nice and easy rational expressions. All right, which of the following is equivalent to this? Now, the first thing I wanna notice, my spidey senses are tingling. There's a minus in here. Okay, subtraction questions go wrong and I'm gonna show you the common mistake. So first thing I try to do is factor. There's no factoring to do. Then I'm gonna get a common denominator. So the first term needs to be multiplied by top and bottom by X. The second term needs to be multiplied top and bottom by X plus two. Okay, here's where the mistake is about to come. X, X plus two, X times one is X. And then I'll see this all the time, friends. The students will do this. They'll go four times X is negative four X. And they'll go four times two is eight. And I just got the question wrong. Okay, I need you to be really careful. Don't multiply it there. 
what I want you to do is this. Because now what I'm going to really watch out for is that that negative gets distributed right to there. So now when I go to simplify, and I apologize, I'm gonna go sideways. Should always go down the page, but I'll go sideways just because I'm out of room. I'm gonna collect like terms. I'm gonna get minus three X minus four times two is minus eight. Answer is D, okay? So please, 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 whenever you see a subtraction question, I want you to think, yeah, they're messing with me, okay? Watch for that negative and don't make that little mistake. All right, what do we got here? A rational expression in the form A over B, so I immediately know I'm gonna to have to find A and B, is multiplied to that, can be simplified to this, all right? Celine knows the original rational expression can be formed by selecting expressions for A and B from the tables below. Sure, she does. Okay, so our job is going to be find A and B. So, all right, what do we got? So, what we know for sure is we've got this term, and it ends up being this. So, what we're going to have to do here is just get some hot pink going. Is just do a little bit of trial and error. What I'm going to say to myself is, okay, I want to get rid of what here? I notice there's only one M in my answer. And right now I've got really three M's. I've got M cubed. So I'm going to get rid of an two M's. So I'm going to try this one here. So I'm going to say that's N M squared, right? So that would right there, get rid of, divide out our m's, but then I would have n times n squared is n cubed. I want just an n, so I've got to get rid of n cubed, and I also have to get rid of the three and the six. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my work. Did that work? Well, two times three is six, and six divided by six is one. Nailed it n cubed over n cubed. Oh, wait a minute. Did I screw something up there? Yeah, I screwed up. Did you see that? I made a mistake, so I'm not going to choose number four. So that's why you check your work. I screwed up. I'm going to choose that one. And so now I'm going to go back, and that's really n squared. And now I'm going to end up with just that n in the bottom. See? Good thing I checked my work. Okay, so what do we end up with then? The code would be three, six. Now, it does tell me there's more than one correct answer. I don't care. I finally found an answer in that crazy question. I'm not stopping and going to find the other one. I'm happy that I've got a answer. All right. Ooh, a rational equation. Okay, a scuba diver dives below 33 feet, the time T in minutes that she can remain underwater safely without a decompression saw can be modeled by the function blah, where D represents the maximum depth. T is time. So I always want to know what my variables are. During a 50 minute dive, what that tells me right off the bat is T is 50. The maximum depth, we're looking for D. So all I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna sub in T. And this is actually a really easy rational expression. I'm gonna multiply both sides by D minus 33. I get 50 D minus, oh geez, what's 50 times 33? No idea, let's find out if my calculator wants to work. That's 1650 is equal to 1700. I'm going to add 1650 to both sides. So I'm going to get 3350. And I'm going to divide 3350 by 50. And I get 67. There it is. And I can check my work really easily by then sticking in 67 into the formula and making sure I end up with 50. Okay, I mean, that was a pretty easy rational equation. Rational equations can be beasts. Maybe I spoke too soon. Look at this one. While correctly solving the rational equation, 
a student wrote an equivalent quadratic equation. Okay, so what this is telling us is we've got to solve this thing. All right, first thing I look to do is get a common denominator. Well, my common denominator is going to be 5 multiplied by x plus 2. So I'm going to multiply the first term by x plus 2. Got my common denominator. I'm going to multiply the second term by 5. And I'm going to run out of room here. But what I've got to remember is I have to multiply the other side. So I'm going to go 2x times 5 times x plus 2. Sorry, I'm just squeaking it in there. And down in the denominator, 5x plus 2. Okay, now that we have a common denominator, we don't need the denominators anymore. And I'm going to distribute the numerator. So 3x times x is 3x squared plus 6x plus 6x plus 12 plus 25x is equal to 2 times x is 10x. Just going to take my time there. Okay, keep simplifying. So 3x squared, 6x plus 6x plus 25x sounds like, what to me, 37x plus 12 is equal to 10x squared plus 20x. Okay, I'm going to bring everything to the right-hand side. So I'm going to subtract 3x squared. I get 7x squared minus 17x minus 12. And boom, goes the dynamite. There it is. Okay, so there's a rational equation that has a little bit more work involved. They're probably, to me, the most difficult part of 30-2. Okay, let's try another one. Ooh, we're into logs. Okay, so logs, what are we going to do? It says, they give us these four crazy expressions, and it says the expression with the largest numeric value is numbered something and the smallest numeric value. So, okay, that means these are all equal to something. So, okay, what am I going to do? First thing I need you to do here, friends, is I need you to remember, as they're writing it with R's, that using my change of base formula, this is really r over r, which is 1. So this is 3 times 1, which is 3. All right, we know the first one. Let's do the rainbow here. Next one, well, I'm going to simplify that. r times r is r squared. But then I'm going to use my power law. So if you need to go to your formula sheet, friends, here's your laws of logs. My power law says if I have my power, I can turn it into my coefficient. So this is going to be 2 times log rr. And log rr is just 1. So this is 2. All right, what about the next one? OK, I'm going to, again, simplify. It looks like I might run out of room here again, friends. I'm sorry. OK, I'm going to subtract my exponents. So that's really r to the negative 1. And now what I'm hoping you can see is that power becomes my coefficient. This one's negative one. And what about our last one? Let's go this. Well, r divided by r is one. And what I need you to remember is whenever you've got an argument of one in a logarithm, that's immediately going to be zero. And if you forget, friends, all you do is you just go and put log one with a common base in your calculator. Okay, so to go from largest to smallest, well, my largest looks like it's three, so that's expression one, and my smallest is negative one, that's expression three, like that. And is this numeric response? This is multiple choice, so it says one, three, so it looks like answer is A. Okay, so I mean, there was some serious log simplification you had to do in there. What do we got here? When the expression, there's these couple of logs, and it says where the base is bigger than one. Okay, well, the base is bigger than one, no big deal, is written in this form. We want the value of a. Okay, so all I say to myself here is there's two logs and there's a minus sign in between. What do I do? 
go to my formula sheet. There she is. What do I do? If there's a minus sign in between, I'm going to divide. So written as a single logarithm, this is 32 over seven. And then all we gotta do is put 32 over seven in our calculator. And I get approximately, this says to the nearest hundy, 4.57. There it is, answer 4.57. And that was a pretty easy law of logs question. The log equation, blah, where a is bigger than one. So again, it's just being mathematically correct that the base is bigger than one. I mean, the base can be bigger than zero, but it can't be one. Expressed in exponential form. Ah, okay. So what they're gonna want us to do here is they're gonna want us to convert to an exponential. Now, there's more than one way to convert this to an exponential that I see. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a peek at my answers. And my first thought was to divide by two, but I don't see C divided by two anywhere there. So I'm not doing that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use my power law. So I'm gonna bring up that B the square to the b. Now I'm going to convert this to an exponential. Now, if I don't remember how to convert to an exponential, guess what? It's on my formula sheet. It's right there. I'm in log form. Base stays the same, and the x and the y's switch spots because they're inverses. So I come over here, and I say base stays the same, and the other two switch spots. There she is, answer is B, okay? So converting from exponential to log, you have to know how to do that at this point. And if you forget, good thing it's on your formula sheet, right? All right, what do we got here? Antoine incorrectly solved the equation. His work is shown below. We gotta find their first recorded error. Okay, let's step by step this. So step one, he made the bases the same. So he said two squared, two cubed, bueno. Step two, what it looks like he's doing is he's distributing the two, but this is his mistake. Two times two is four, but then you need to multiply that there. That should be two X and that should be three. Errors, step two, problem solved. All right, there's an easy one for us, not too bad. All right, here we go, we're almost there. There's only 24 multiple choice questions, we're on 19. All right, what do we got? Take a sip of coffee and let's read this thing. All right, what I see is we're starting with this many farming families. We're decreasing by a rate of this. Now, in this, this is this form. So A is how many people I began with. We began with 31,850. Immediately I know those are not answers. Now, what's my base? Well, I'm decreasing friends. So I start with 100% and I'm losing 3.3%. So I always start with 100. And if I'm increasing, I add. If I'm decreasing, I subtract. Answer has got to be D. There it is. All right, I mean, that's an easy exponential function. Didn't even have us solve that thing. All right, what do we got here? I see a regression in my future. So a design for a new arena must be the new Saddle Dome in Calgary. We're not fancy like Edmonton with Rogers Place yet. A design for a new sports arena is tested to measure the pressure placed on the building's exterior in force per square foot for various wind speed in miles per hour. Okay, even though we're in Canada, apparently we're doing things in imperial. The data is listed below. All right, these data can be modeled by the quadratic regression. So they always tell you the regression. Now, friends, we're gonna do this regression, but before I do, you almost always get a regression in your written. The easiest one mark on your diploma perform a regression. To get full marks, friends, on your regression, 
you must write the equation y equals and write everything out. I'm just making up numbers here. This doesn't match this. That's the only way you get full marks. If you write this, you get 0 0.5 out of 1. If you go through and you know how your calculator gives you A's, B's, and C's, and you write this, guess what? You get 0 0.5 out of 1. Don't do that. On the written, you must write Y equals. Okay, now that has nothing to do with this question. I'm just trying to give you some pointers. It just makes me sad that how poorly regressions are done on the written portion. It literally tells you what type of regression and just write Y equals. Okay, we need to do the regression for this beast. So grab your graphing calculator. I'm gonna grab my emulator and we go. And we, when we reset our calculator, we should be in radian mode. We don't do degrees in 30-2. Stat, edit. Okay, I've got some garbage in here, so I'm gonna clear it out. Okay, and I go and I put my data in. So it was zero and 20. Oh no, it wasn't. It was 40 and that was actually my next word of advice. When you do a regression, go slow and double check your data. Because if you put something in wrong, unfortunately, one piece wrong means you get that question wrong. So now I'm putting in zero and my wife feels pity for me. She walked in the room, she sees me doing regressions and I'm getting a little bit of a back massage here. So this regression is gonna go perfect. How she's leaving because she knows I'm recording this and she's embarrassed. <laughs> Never hurts to do a, get a massage while you're doing a regression. Okay, no massages for you during your diploma. Okay, there it is. Here's my data. I'm gonna double check it quickly. Everything's in my calculator. I go stat over to calc and I go down to, this tells me it was a quadratic. It's right there. And then what I wanna do is I wanna store this bad boy, so vars, Y vars, Y1, enter, calculate, yes, sir. Now it's in my Y equals, everything's there. But if I go and hit graph, I don't see anything good. So what I'm gonna do is change my window settings. So I go to window, X was wind speed. So the lowest wind speed I can ever have is zero. The highest wind speed in the table was 80. So I'm gonna go up to a hundy. And I don't know, I'm just gonna make my scale big, 25. Okay, why is my pressure? Well, the lowest amount of pressure I can ever have is zero. I don't know what the highest pressure is. In the table, it was 24.2. I'm just gonna to go to 30. It's a bit of a guess and I'll make my scale big, 10. Okay, what I should see when I hit graph here is only quadrant one. It's the only quadrant that makes sense and it looks good. Okay, now I go back to, oh, you didn't see me do any of that, friends. I am so sorry. So what I did again is I went stat, edit. I put that all in my regression. I went stat over to calc, down to quad reg, enter. I stored it in Y vars. There's my equation. I went to Y equals, it's there. But then I had to change my window settings to match the information in the question. Okay, sorry about that, friends. I forgot to share screen with you there. And so now when I hit graph, there it is. So what the question asked me, I don't even remember. So let's go back to our question. I don't even know says based on the quadratic regression, the pressure created by a wind speed, so that's X, we want the pressure, we've got X. So I go back to my calculator and this time I'll be smart and actually share it with you. I know X, value, I want Y, there it is. I get a whopping value of whatever the heck that is. 1.14, okay? So again, friends, you just gotta make sure you're getting that regression stuff in. And so again, you just go 
stat edit. And you just make sure you've got everything in there correctly and everything looks like it matches up. You slam it in your graphing calculator and you sub in your value. Okay, perfect. Let's go back to our test. So there's a regression out of the way, no problem. All right, what do we got here? We only got four more multiple choice to go. We are at the tail end of our diploma. So we're gonna get two polynomials and two sinusoidals to finish our diploma here. That's how our diplomas end. So it says the graph of a cubic function where a is less than zero, d is greater than zero. Okay, extends from quadrant to quadrant and the sign of the y-intercept. Okay, friends, what do I know? Well, if a is less than zero, it means my graph ends going down. So it's gonna end down here. It's cubic, so it starts up here. So I immediately know we're going from quadrants two to four. Done. D is greater than zero. Friends, that's my constant term, also known as my y-intercept. So I don't know quite what this thing's gonna do. For all I know, it does that. But I know it goes from two to four and my y-intercept is positive. There it is, amigos. There's that one. So again, the lead coefficient tells you how you end. The degree helps you tell how you start. And the constant term is the y-intercept. Answer is A. All right, what do we got here? Science class is investigating trajectories by launching balls with a catapult. Pretty cool. The path of one particular ball can be modeled by this, where H is height in meters above ground and T is time. Which of these represents the appropriate domain of this function? Okay, so again, I'm going to switch over to my graphing calculator. This time I'll be smart and actually share it with you. There we go. Okay, I'm going to clear all this out. The equation they gave me was negative 4.9x squared plus seven X plus 0.5. Now, my window settings, I'm gonna change them to match the domain and range kind of that was in the question. So it went from zero, and then the biggest domain I saw was 1.5, so I'm gonna go to two, who cares about scale? Range went from zero to three, so I'm gonna go zero to five, who cares about scale? Hit graph. Okay, so if I want my domain and range, all I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna find first my maximum, because that's gonna help me find my range. So left bound, just gonna hold it over until I'm over there. Enter, right bound, hold it over, enter. So my highest value is three. So I know my range goes from zero to three. Then for my domain, what I wanna find is that positive X intercept. So what I like to do is to go to Y2, let it equal zero. Hit graph. Now I'm gonna find that positive x-intercept by finding the point of intersection. First curve, second curve, guess. Intersection 1.49, we'll guess that. That's 1.5, right? So we go back over to here, and what did we say? We said 1.5 is our highest furthest domain, three was our highest point. <clears throat> there we go, we brought that. Okay, we're almost there. Ferris wheel at a local fair. Good old Ferris wheel, right? Has a diameter of 68 meters. Has a max height of 74. When discussing the graph of the sinusoidal function, because that's what everyone does when they're on a Ferris wheel, six students made the following statements. Okay, I see everything here about median, minimum, amplitude. I'm drawing a picture. What do I know? Well, the highest point is 74. The diameter is 68. So that's the distance from 74 down to here. Well, what that tells me is I get on six feet above ground. That's my minimum. Now, right in the middle is our median. To find my median is the average of 74 and six. 
So D is 74 plus 6 divided by 2. That's 40. Okay, now let's answer some questions. The median value is 34. No, that's a lie. Statement 2. The minimum value is 0. No, the Ferris wheel hits the ground. We've got ourselves a bit of a problem if people were on it. The amplitude. Well, amplitude is half the diameter, or I just count. It's right there. Amplitude is 34. So our correct answer should be 2, 4, 5. And there it is, answer D. All right, our last two questions, friends. What do we got? The regular rise and fall of the ocean's water level can limit the times at which a ship enters a harbor and exits. On a given day, the depth of the water in particular is given by this function, where T is time in hours after midnight. Okay, I always want to know when I'm starting from. Particular ship requires a minimum depth of that. At what time can they first enter the harbor? Okay, so we're looking for X. And we know why. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, and again, I'm going to graph this thing. So I'll be smarter this time again, and I'll actually share my emulator with you. Again, I need to be in radian mode my entire diploma. You are never in degree mode. If you are in degree mode for this question, you're going to get the answer wrong. Don't do that. Degrees are dead to you in 30-2. Okay, all we're going to do is plop in our equation. And again, what I find most difficult about this is finding the window settings. Now, it said we want a time, and we know the minimum depth is this. So in Y2, I'm going to plunk in 13.15. Now, window settings. X is time. So the smallest amount of time I can ever have is zero. Okay, it's tides coming in and out. I don't know. I'm just going to go for 24 hours. It's an entire day. Scale is ridiculously big. That's good. Okay, why min? Well, technically, I mean, I could figure out what it is in the equation, but it's always got to be bigger than zero. So I'll just leave it at zero. Why max? Well, I add my D and my A value together. That looks like about like 16 or so roughly. I'm going to go to 20. Good enough. Hit graph. Beautiful wave. There's my curve. I want to know the first time that they can safely enter the harbor. So I find that point of intersection. And I'm just going to get it all the way over there. We're talking right there. And first curve, second curve, guess who cares? There it is. 4.277. So I go back to my multiple choice. And I make sure that I actually did that correctly. And there it is, it's answer B. Okay, so again, friends, you're always in radian mode. You should have done nothing to do with degrees. I hope you didn't spend any time converting degrees to radians. It's not part of the course. Always in radians. You also don't look at cosine graphs. So if you looked at some cosine graphs in class, you didn't need to do that. Okay, last question and we are done. And I'm going to celebrate because my voice actually held up through this video. Almost. Let's make sure we get there, right? An electric toy car is traveling around a circular track at a constant speed. A ruler is positioned beside the track is shown below. Okay. That's a little weird. Like, why isn't it? I don't know. It's weird. Why isn't the ruler starting at zero here? All right. Whatever. It is what it is, right? And it says the position of the car measured in centimeters with the ruler can be modeled by this function, where P is the position in centimeters and T is the time elapsed in seconds. The amplitude, the amplitude is my A value. Boom, 30. And the time it takes to go around. Okay, that's the period. We want the period. All right, for the last time, I'm gonna go back to my formula sheet. And I've done all sorts of good stuff here and sinusoidals right there. Period is 2 pi divided by B. Period is 2 pi divided by B. B is pi half. Now, put that in your calculator. Be careful. Maybe put that in parentheses or use your fraction button. But if I put that thing in my calculator, I'm just going to scroll down here. 
I'm just going to play it safe. I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal my periods four seconds. So answer is A. That's it, friends. You survived an entire diploma. I hope my voice wasn't too annoying given how sick I am. I apologize for forgetting to share a screen that one time. I will feel shame for a long time for that. Okay, I hope that video helped you out. I will see you in another video. I'll do some reading stuff.